Okay. Come on, baby. Come on, If you are, I'm not rushing you, Nicole. I just want to make sure you're not waiting on me. Okay, it's broadcasting, so we're ready to go. If you are, okay. Um, I'd like to call this meeting of the LSU Presidential Search Committee to order. Ms. Griffith, would you please call the roll? Yes, sir. Mr. Glenn Armenter? Mr. Verge Osbury? Here. Ms. Hannah Berrios? Here. Mr. Chip Campbell? Mr. Clarence Cazalot? Here. Mr. Larry Clark? Ms. Gabriella Gonzalez? Here. Mr. Lester Johnson? Here. Ms. Valencia Jones? Here. Ms. Jessica Jones? Here. Mr. Luke Laborde? Here. Ms. Lori Martin? Here. Mr. Roland Mitchell? Here. Mr. Steve Nelson? Ms. Christelle Slaughter? Ms. Tara Smith? Here. Mr. Ramey Starnes? Here. Ms. Takara Wagner? Here. Ms. Mary Werner? Here. Mr. James Williams? Here. Okay, Mr. Williams, we have a quorum to begin. And I think Mr. Larry Clark has just joined us. Yes. Okay, perfect. I have you down as attending. Okay, perfect. Um, Ms. Jones, would you mind, Supervisor Jones, would you mind uh, giving us the invocation? Um, <laughs> yes. Um, you caught me so off guard. Uh, <laughs> I was I'm reading sorry, an email. I'm, I'm sorry. Look, I, okay. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll do it. I'm sorry. I'll cut you off guard. I'll do the invocation. I'm ready. Okay, go ahead. I, I pledge allegiance, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, uh, I'll go ahead and give us an invocation. Everybody, please bow your heads. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we thank you for allowing us to assemble here today. We ask you to please guide us as we do important work for the citizens of Louisiana. We know that none is perfect, but your son who walked this earth. And so we ask you for forgive us for our faults, these and other things we ask in the name of your son, amen. Right. Um, okay, now we have, uh, I have invited uh, former LSU Board of Supervisor member and uh, former chair of the LSU Presidential Search Committee, Blake Chatelaine, to uh, bring us greetings today. We were supposed to be in Alexandria, his hometown, but uh, of course we adjusted the meeting to a virtual meeting uh, because of what's going on in our state from a public health standpoint. So uh, I just wanted to give Blake an opportunity to, to say hello to the group, uh, impart any words of wisdom, and uh, Blake, we'll hear from you. Okay, and, and James, I'm not sure exactly what you would like me to cover, but one, let me say uh, that it's great to be with y'all, and I wish you the best in this endeavor. Uh, it's a huge job, but I know y'all will, will do great, and, and uh, again, thank you for letting me uh, play a small part in this. Uh, you know, I did send, I was going through some of my files, and I sent to James and, and Nicole and, and, and a couple of others uh, some of the uh, stuff, uh, if you would, some of the documents from our last search committee, the timelines and, and kind of the process that we went through. So you may want to, James, share that with the group it, it, if it helps y'all just to think of some things. You know, my, my thoughts, and I'll, if you don't mind, I'll give you a quick rundown of, of what we did. Uh, I will say that, James, I'm not sure why you want to hear from me. The only time I've ever been 
on a witness stand uh, was in conjunction with the last search uh, when, when we were sued uh, over the, the, uh, the records. So uh, again, uh, take, take my advice with a grain of salt. But you know what I would say, I think every search is different. Every search depends upon the time and, and where you are. Uh, the search that we went through uh, back in 2012, the vacancy uh, of the president's office occurred in 2012. In the spring of 2012, we hired AGB to come in before we launched the search and study the system and look at uh, what organizational changes may be in order. And I think that AGB study is out there and has been distributed to many of you to, to review. And so we went through a comprehensive analysis and look at the structure of, of LSU. Uh, in July of 2012, we kind of had our initial meeting to start getting organized. Uh, we were guided by the council, LSU council at the time, Ray LaMonica, who helped us structure the search. Uh, in August, we received the AGB report and made, it, made some decisions on what changes we wanted to ask the new president uh, once, once found uh, to make with LSU uh, or to make for LSU and lead us through. And so that was reviewed and decided in August. Uh, and uh, shortly after that, we started a series, the committee started a series of meetings with the faculty and, and community trying to outreach and get their opinions on what they thought was important as we uh, identified the next leader uh, for LSU. We also, and, and I don't know that, I don't think Christelle's on this morning, but she would be very familiar with the transition advisory committees that we set up because we formed a number of transition advisory committees to to start making recommendations of the changes. There's, there's Christelle. Christelle, I was just talking about you. Uh, I so, heard that, Rob. Thank you. So, so the transition committee uh, started to work on what are the, what were the hurdles, what are the things that needed to be addressed in, with it by a new president, by a new system, and so uh, there was a lot of stuff that was happening all at one time. Uh, by the fall, I think we had a good plan of what we wanted to ask our new president to do. Uh, and so at that point, we were, we were pretty clear that we were also, based on the feedback that we had heard, looking for a president who had been in the big chair before, that had experience as a, as a president. Uh, and so we kind of built those qualifications that we were looking for that we could specify as we started the search. So really, I think in November, our search was, was ready to get going. Uh, the, the final committee ended up being a committee of eight board members. Uh, and three faculty members, and we launched the search. Uh, the first 90 days was kind of a presidential candidate develop, development uh, uh, where we were seeking resumes and seeking interest. Our search committee, which was Mr. Funk out of Dallas on, on this search, uh, set up a portal, and that portal had all of the potential applicants that were listed or that had expressed interest built into the portal. And so uh, our members could go into that portal and look at the candidates, look at their background, decide if they were potential people that we wanted to, to, to talk to further. Uh, we kind of asked the committee to rank or, or to come up with their top 10 list. Uh, and so the, the work of the committee was to narrow what was probably, I would say, if I remember correctly, 75 to 100 expressions of interest that really was across the gamut from uh, provost to non-traditional candidates uh, to faculty members to uh, sitting presidents and, and so uh, we narrowed from that a top 10 list uh, the committee kind of debated uh, that top 10 list and, and shortened it down uh, to a kind of a top five and at that point narrowed it down even further to a top three and, and that is the, the candidates that we started reaching out to and doing interviews with we kind of did airport interviews where we flew in and met them at an airport uh, and, and, and uh, you know, kind of uh, interviewed them to see uh, out of those candidates, did we think there was one that we wanted to encourage uh, further, uh, further discussions. Of course, as, as you know from history, uh, we really narrowed it down to really one of those three that we felt was what we were looking for, that we brought into campus, let the whole board talk to, let them do campus visits, and then, of course, named uh, uh, King Alexander as, as the next president. So that's kind of a quick, uh, real quick overview of what we did. And again, I think every search is a little bit different. Uh, James, I have, uh, you know, again, sent you some, some of that stuff. If you want to share those, 
those timelines. If that helps you, uh, pl please, please share that. And why don't with that, I pause and I'll be glad to maybe answer any questions that might be on, on your mind that I could, or that I haven't covered. Oh, look, I think that's, uh, that's great. That's sort of what I had in mind was just for you to sort of describe the experience of the committee before this committee so that we could kind of have some context as we move forward. And like you said, every search is different, but we certainly want to hear from someone like you who, who has sat in the seat we sit in now. So um, I, I thank you for, for taking your time to do it. Yeah, Christelle. Before you go, Blake, I apologize. I didn't have my screen fully up and you sounded so much like Rob. There's one word that you say that just has that Rob Stewart twang. It's, it's um, the banker. It's the, the banker. Oh, it's the banker thing. Sure. Um, uh, would you just say a couple of words about uh, organization structure uh, and um, sort of the uh, maybe a little bit um, naivete or, or fumbling at first, but then as you got into the search, how did that play out in terms of importance and, and um, uh, specificity in terms of interviewing candidates? Was, was it important? Was it less important? Would you address that? Well, and when you, when you say organizational structure, are you saying organization of the committee? No, um, you know, uh, we first made the decision to have a strong president model and mm -hmm. uh, not have a chancellor at the flagship campus. That this we've gotten past that, but now how many direct reports? How are they organized? Uh, if you remember around that time, Bill Richardson uh, mm -hmm. thought there was going to be a movement in one direction, took a different title. Um, you know, there was there was a lot of um, frenzy in the beginning about maybe people not report who had traditionally reported to the president, not reporting to the president. We're, we're kind of in that again right now, sure. so. And can we, Christelle, I'm not, not, not to cut you off, but because we've got, the very next thing I was gonna say is we've got um, our search firm on, and I, I don't want to, maybe what I would ask is we defer that discussion to a later meeting, because what we're gonna, what I was about to announce is, we're probably gonna devote the majority of our time to our search firm working group report through which we will hear from the search firm, which means, and, and Luke, I'm sorry, but what that means is we're gonna to have to dramatically truncate that working group this meeting. So maybe if you and- Blake I just want to Blake, it, while we have him to say, sure. did the candidates expect you to have a firm organization chart? And did you have one when you went through the search process? I would say we did not have a, because look, we had a big picture idea of how we wanted it to work, but I think we did not, you know, we, we thought we needed that professional to come and help us build out the rest of the arc chart and, and build the support for it. And, and then, uh, so, so I, I, I don't think you can put all of those pieces in place day one, but I think having a, a big picture idea of where you want to go and what you're charging that person to do is very important. Thank you, Blake. And thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. I apologize. Yeah, no, no problem. I just I want to try to keep us on on track. But that, but certainly, I'm glad we have Blake here to answer these uh, these questions for us. All right, um, Blake. Once again, thank you, and uh, we'll be calling on you. I'll distribute. I will distribute your materials to the committee. I think uh, Nicole is actually has them and is going to do that. But we'll make sure everybody has what you passed on. And again, thank you for your time. So you, I, I'm gonna sign off. Well, well it's a public meeting, you're welcome to, to stay and visit as long <laughs> as you like. <laughs> no, I'm just getting your permission, but uh, good luck to y'all. Thank you. All right. Good Thank you. you all. all right. So uh, at this point, I want to move into uh, uh, reporting from the search firm working group. And on the call, we have, uh, well, I'll let Mary make the introductions because it's her working group. We ultimately, um, I'm sorry, Supervisor Werner, I'll let her make the introduction, but this is we have the firm together that you as a committee selected. And so uh, Mary, why don't you make the introduction and then we'll, uh, we're gonna give them a significant part of the time today to talk with us. Thanks, Chairman Williams. I appreciate that so much. Um, good morning, everyone. After um, extensive interviews and a lot of um, work that the committee did, and again, I wanna thank my committee for uh, the, the advanced timeline and, and working so diligently on this and with uh, Chairman Williams' direction, 
We, uh, as you know, last week presented to you three candidates and this body chose Parker Executive as the firm to lead this very important search. Um, I apologize that I am on a smaller screen, so I cannot see everybody joining us, but we had very good discussions and I'm looking forward to you all getting to hear uh, the presentation today from the representatives of Parker, uh, led by Laurie Wilder and Portia Williams, who is in the higher education um, area of the search. We were also joined in our interviews by Julie Palmer Johnson, um, so at this time, uh, I will not try to speak any more on their behalf and let them take it from here um, and look forward to hearing their presentation and the good questions and discussion. I know that we'll follow that, Mr. Chairman. Um, so with that, I will hand this over to our search firm, Parker Executive. Thank you. Well, good morning to everyone. Um, my name is Laurie Wilder and I'm president of Parker Executive Search. Um, on this call, we have Portia Williams as well, and she's vice president of our higher education practice. And then Grant Higgison is a part of this call as well, and he's a principal in our firm. Uh, and Julie um, was with us originally, and she'll be with us again, but she had a commitment today. Uh, and so what we wanted to do today is, number one, thank you for the opportunity. You have a big challenge ahead of you. Um, you're going to have to do a lot of hard work um, and, and to find that right person and look for that great pool of of candidates to ultimately forward to the full board of supervisors for their consideration. Um, just in two seconds kind of about who we are, because what I said to Mr. Williams is that we really wanted to spend most of this call today listening to you, because I think that's an important component of, of this search process. But we are based in Atlanta, Georgia. And about 90% of what we do on a given day is done on a college or university campus. And so we're a firm that has four practice areas. We have higher education, where, where we represent universities in their searches for our, um, academic leaders. We have the number one sports practice in the country in collegiate athletics, where we recruit football coaches, athletic directors, and commissioners, as well as basketball and some hockey here and there. Um, and, and then we have an academic health sciences practice, where we represent medical schools. And then we have a small corporate practice where we're a generalist firm, but our level of expertise is really about how do you recruit talent into higher education? And, you know, it's been some time since your last search and a lot has changed uh, in that period of time as it relates to how you go about search. How do you recruit candidates? Obviously in the last nine months or so, a lot more has changed with the pandemic and, and how do you recruit leaders during that? And so we look forward, quite frankly, to working with all of you to ensure you see the broadest and most diverse pool of candidates for your consideration consideration in a time that is very difficult as it relates to recruiting candidates and respectfully in a time where there's a lot of competition in the marketplace um, at other universities that are conducting very similar searches. And so really what we talked to a small group of this committee about uh, yesterday was to have a conversation about how do we get started. And so what I wanted to do is just very briefly talk to you a little bit about process and then as we get on board a little closer, um, then we can gain some more information about exactly how this process is gonna unfold. How do we ensure transparency of the process while also maintaining you know, as much of it as we can from the standpoint of recruiting candidates. And so um, process wise, what we've talked about is very early in this, we've got to move forward to writing position descriptions, developing timelines, having listening sessions, engage the campus constituency groups in, a conversation about what they're looking for, for in candidates and what do you see as the opportunities and challenges going forward. So today's call, that's what we really want to talk about. General overview of the process is that we anticipate that we'll recruit very aggressively uh, through the end of this year and through probably January you as a committee will start to see and review candidate materials towards the end of January. And then because of the public nature of your search, we will move very quickly to, to get to a decision where you are interviewing those individuals. Um, we call them airport interviews as well. That's changed dramatically with the pandemic and we'll have to work through some of that. Most of our clients are doing that initial interview through Zoom. 
Um, and that's got good and bad to it, but we'll work through that together as a committee and as an organization. And then ultimately how you make a recommendation to the board of supervisors and then that end of those candidates come and visit with the different constituency groups and with the board. So it'll be a process that we hope that will be finished in the mid part of February, but the very details associated with every step in that search, we're gonna get to you ASAP. So we have a meeting with the general counsel, a call with the general counsel scheduled for next week so that we can understand all of your rules and regulations. And then we'll be able to come back to you as a committee um, to talk about all the very specifics. Um, our objective is to get you to agree to the timeline in every step, step of the way. So the days that we're gonna have Zoom update calls where we talk about the pool, the dates that we're going to you know, have conversations about how you evaluate candidates. Um, there'll be a conference call about how, you know, what questions do you want to ask candidates? What are those major criteria that you want to consider them with? Um, all of that obviously it goes back to your position description. So as you write rubrics and as you determine how you're going to vet candidates, you need to start with that document in mind. And I think Gabby's group has done a tremendous job to get that position description um, in, a, in a really strong order. And then I think what we're going to do, just so you all know, is the week after Thanksgiving, uh, we're going to ask your campus constituency groups to provide feedback through a survey so that they can say not feedback on the document, but feedback on what they're looking for in candidates. We will do one day of Zoom listening sessions where we'll have an opportunity, and that's, again, we want to get approval for all of this, but we'll have an opportunity to allow faculty, staff, students, as well as the community to engage in a conversation with us. I think that's important to gain the buy-in on the front end that you as a committee are listening and that you care about what they're thinking about from that perspective. So <laughs> We have a lot to do in the next seven days or so to get the process itself set up. Um, the process may be a little different than what we just were, we just was described from that perspective, um, because we need to you know make sure that we're doing this so that none of you are deposed at the end of this search process as well. Uh, and so we'll go through some of that to ensure that we're doing this all correctly from that standpoint. So. Before we ask you questions and listen, I'm just going to stop right there and see if you have any questions about us, um, about process, about the market, those types of things as well. All right. S seeing no one going off mute, um, I, I assume. <laughs> I Lori, let me um, uh, say that, uh, as you say, we. We did talk about, and, and uh, I personally, we haven't talked it with our job description group, but I'm sure we are all very supportive of the plan on asking for feedback. We may need more than one listening session, <laughs> uh, but uh, I am very much looking forward to, uh, to seeing the results of a poll done soon after Thanksgiving. Sure. Thanks, cool. Gabby. Hello. I want to, yeah, I was going to say, I want to encourage everyone. I know I've heard from you all both in our prior meetings and, and individually about wanting to engage with the search firm to get our questions answered and to give them information as we, as we march forward. So today's the day I would encourage everybody to, to, to because that, that's, that's why they're here. And this is our, our introductory meeting. So I'd encourage everybody to, to take it off mute and, and let it rip so we can have a productive discussion with them. Hey, Lori, this is Clarence Caslot. I, I certainly applaud the, uh, the listening sessions you're going to do via Zoom with uh, faculty, students in the community and, and others. I guess I would ask the question, uh, is one day enough? I think that's kind of what, what Gabby's saying, but also uh, will those sessions be publicly available and will the committee uh, have access to that, uh, to that direct feedback as well? Absolutely. And so when I say one day, I mean, we're going to have multiple sessions within that day. Uh, it may be over a couple of day period from that perspective. But what we would normally suggest, especially since we have been giving a very aggressive timeline as to which to meet, is that we've got to compact some of this as well. So this is all very important. But at the end of the day, the hardest part of any search is recruiting candidates. I mean, that, that's what takes that time. So we want to make sure that we have the opportunity for constituency groups. So what we might see is 
is a constituency group. Again, it would be in the public domain. It would be a Zoom open to all, but we may say emphasize this one is particularly for staff, right? So we'd like to hear kind of the concerns and issues and, and opportunities from staff. We would have another one that would be for faculty, another one that would be specifically for students, and then another one that would be for community. We typically add a fourth one that's just kind of open to everyone in case you can't make one of those initial um, conversations. What we have found in the pandemic is doing it through Zoom, we've seen significantly more people engage in that process than when we used to come to campus for a day. So we used to come to campus, we'd sit there for a day, day and a half. You may see 30 people all throughout the day for searches like this, which is sad, but true. And now we're seeing hundreds of people dial into these Zooms to really kind of hear what their colleagues are thinking as well. So we'll work through that. I think Gabby will work through to make sure it's the right thing. We don't want to do too little from that perspective, but we also can't elongate it into a significant amount of time into December in order for us to recruit. One of the things that we really feel strongly about is when you develop a position description and then you say to constituency groups, we want to listen to you talk about what you're looking for in candidates. And you've already agreed to a position description. You've already advertised a position description. People feel as if you're just going through the motions, right? You didn't really care what I said to go on the document that's going to drive the whole thing. And so we want to get this done. And that's why we're trying to have a sense of urgency as to when we have these meetings so that we can take the document that the working group has worked on, ensure that there's nothing that we are hearing in the marketplace from these constituency groups that changes that document, right? That may be missing from that document. Because if there's anything we've learned, if you're gonna ask for people for their opinions, then you need to actually listen to their opinions and then see how you might be able to react and adjust. I would venture to guess you're not gonna hear anything that's much more dramatic or different than what you all as members of this committee who are representing these constituency groups think as well. So those will be open. I would strongly encourage you as committee members to engage in those. We're going to, we'll send all of this to you in email, but we want you to be a part of that. I think it's critically important for you to hear what those constituency groups are thinking, because as you evaluate candidates, as you start to determine who those candidates are that you want to move forward in the process, I think you need to pay attention to the, the key issues that are happening for those different constituency groups. We also will take very copious notes during those calls. Um, you as a committee will have access to a website. That's quite frankly what we're trying to determine through the general counsel is, you know, it's our URL. How does that impact those things? What can be a part of that document? But we will share all of that um, with you directly, kind of what we hear. But we want you to engage as well. I think that also sends a message to those constituency groups that you're listening. Thank you. Sorry, I'm Larry Clark. I'm the chancellor at LSU, Shreve, <clears throat> excuse me, LSU Shreveport. And when you're talking about the constituency groups, they were they sound like they might be pretty much about the flagship. And of course, there are entities within LSU that are not the flagship. And so somehow I think having something probably by Zoom, because you can't possibly possibly get out to the different all the different entities, but there are other entities to think about as well and how that's done. No, absolutely. And, and I, I think when I talk about faculty, staff, students, community groups, those types, I'm talking about the broad level. I'm not just talking about the Baton Rouge campus. They will all be done by Zoom. So we'll make sure that we are communicating this effectively across all of those campuses, because I do think that's critically important. Absolutely. And if I, if I said that different, uh, I apologize. Um, if I may, Larry, about that, I think the survey would be very important. I expect that in the survey, of course, we'll be anonymous, but we will give people the option to uh, to associate, be associated with uh, a constituency, faculty, students, staff, and the campus. So we, and uh, also uh, supporting what Lori was saying, I think uh, it's very important to hear what people what people say. Uh, especially when we talk about different constituencies, but also different different campuses in the system. And what I expect is not so much, uh, like like Laurie said, to to change the the document, but to change the way we evaluate the the qualifications of the candidates that we interview. Uh, when we get a sense from the listening sessions and from the survey on what's important for. Uh, 
for whom, <laughs> uh, for, for the different campuses, for the, uh, for the different constituencies, then we will know better how to evaluate candidates than the, than the search brings to us. And, and That's Gabby, my expectation, at least. <laughs> no, you're spot on. And I think the one piece I, I haven't emphasized enough is the survey that we will send out widespread. And, and that really is going to be kind of an open-ended, what are you looking for? What do you see as the challenges and opportunities? Because that also becomes a sales pitch. So you all are going to be evaluating candidates, but we've got to go out there and really talk in the marketplace. Um, there are searches at Texas A&M, Oklahoma State, Florida State, Wake Forest, uh, Temple, Tulsa. I could go on and on, right? So there's a lot of searches that are out there right now. So we've got to determine what is it that makes you special? And listening to those groups talk about that, the survey itself will be very important to that. Um, that's gonna be a document that we send to everyone. We don't manipulate that data. That data will be presented directly back to you as committee members um, so that you can see kind of what people are thinking from that perspective. I, I agree 100%, Gabby, that I also think that, that what you hear not only goes into the recruitment, but it really goes into the evaluation of these individuals and, and how do you determine who's the right person for the right time. Um, you know, the last search, you, you run a search and you look and I think the, the, the gentleman was exactly correct. Timing is everything. And so, you know, what you need today may not be what you need 10 years from now, but what you've got to do is to look for the right person at the right time uh, in the trajectory of, of all of these campuses and as a, an LSU as a whole. So I think by doing all of those pieces, you really send the message that that's exactly what you're trying to do. Lori, uh, I would like to hear your evaluation of uh, doing searches um, during a, a worldwide pandemic and um, uncertainty and lots of searches going on and how movable are good people and what do you see as our prospects there? Yeah, absolutely. Um, the pandemic has made a significant change in the recruitment of leaders. Um, it's also made a significant change as it relates to how many of these opportunities are going to be out there. Um, I named a few today. There could be four more tomorrow. And, and the reality of it is a lot of individuals are looking at themselves in these positions and saying, am I the right person at the right time, right? I may have been five years ago, but today there's different challenges as it relates to enrollment, as it relates to fiscal issues across this country, as it relates to, you know, social justice issues, all of these different pieces am I the right person to lead an institution forward? Some are realizing that maybe they aren't, right? And some are realizing, you know what, I'm at retirement position right now and I'm going to do that. I'm going to take advantage of that. So I think you're going to see some churn in the marketplace. Um, and, and that's what we're seeing with a lot of these opportunities at this time. What I'd say to you about the pandemic and specifically recruiting is it's taking a little more time to get candidates interested in a position. For us, it may have been two or three calls a year to two years ago. Today, it's six and seven calls with an individual. They're asking for much more information. They want to make sure that they're not going from, you know, a very, very tough job to an even tougher job without the resources, without the commitment from a board, those types of things. And so there's a lot more due diligence that they're doing before they jump. And so we're seeing that we're, we're having to kind of have those levels of conversation with candidates more than we've ever had to do before. Um, I'd also say to you that we're seeing that some candidates or some end of professionals are indicating that, you know, this isn't the job for me. I don't want to be a president of a university when maybe they thought they did before, right? So they thought that that was something. So one of the things that we've been running into over the last several years is just the, the, the pool of candidates itself and, and how broad is that? Because as, as the gentleman said, you know, there's a trajectory to this that you've seen over the years. And one of the things that we're real believers in from a search perspective is to be as open as you possibly can when you start to look at candidates. Look at people with all different types of backgrounds within the academy versus just saying, I have to have a sitting this or I'm going to have a provost or that. Not that there aren't great people in all of those, but in order to build a pool, you've got to be a little nimble, right? You've got to be able to say, listen, what are the key attributes that we're looking for? We're looking for someone who has the highest level of integrity. We're looking for someone who has the ability to connect and communicate with various constituency groups that just don't always get along and don't always agree, right? And so you have all of these, how do you be politically astute enough to balance the world that we're looking at? Do you value diversity, equity, inclusion? And, and is it just words or do you actually mean it? How do you do these things? And so 
that pool of candidates we've got to go out and recruit. So what we're going to say to you is to keep it as broad as you can until you see who those candidates are. So I think he mentioned the last time there's 75 to 100 candidates. Don't get him wrong. There weren't 75 to 100 quality candidates that were completely qualified for that position, right? So these pools are much more shallow. You're looking, you know, if you can find eight or so that are outstanding candidates, um, then you're doing a home run, right? That's a home run right now. I may have said 10 nine months ago. I may have said 12 nine months ago, but we're, you know, we're looking. The other piece I would say to you is that candidates are driving the process more than they ever have before. So I always said as a search consultant in our search committees, we're in control of the process, right? We lay it out and this is what we're gonna do. Candidates are driving that because there's so much going on on their own campuses, right? So one day they're very interested in a search and then something happens on their campus and they've got to walk away from that. Something happens as it relates to an academic issue, an athletic issue, those types of things. And so they're driving the agenda. And so we're going to set a timeline and we've said this uh, to Mr. Williams, we're going to set a timeline and then we're going to watch what happens in the world, right? The pandemic is driving some things. Um, some, some states and clients that we have say, well, it's not affecting us like it is others. And I said, but the candidates coming from somewhere it is affecting. So we have to look at that. It's not always just about you. It's about where they are and what they're experiencing. And so it is not easy. Um, the pool is, is a tough pool, and that's why just tenacious recruiting is the only way to do this. Um, we're going to place ads, and we're going to do those kind of things, but I can assure you that you know the person that you probably will end up with didn't wake up this morning thinking this is what they wanted to do. They've got to learn more about it and get excited about it, uh, and that's what we're going to do, and we're going to need you as search committee members to engage as well. Um, you know, I really believe that search committee members sometimes think that their job is only to vet, right? They're going to vet the candidates that are giving. I need you to engage in the recruiting. And there's going to be times where I'm going to pick up the phone and I'm going to call Mr. Williams and I'm going to say, okay, here's the issue of a candidate. Who's the right person on this committee to talk to them? It could be anything from K through 12 education for their own children to academic programming to fundraising and what is the annual campaign, what's capital campaigns, all of those types of things. And so we're going to engage you in that because quite frankly, we need you. You know, you know we sell at a very 40,000 foot level, um, but we need you to engage in this as well. But the pandemic has changed everything. Thank you. And Laurie, this is Luke Laborde. Um, while I certainly support an aggressive schedule, it is really important that we do this right. And so if you need to tell us at some point that we have to slow down, that we need more time, I'd see that as an important part of your assignment. So. Mr. Williams has already can confirm I've already said that. So we we have uh, pushed it to an agreement where we think we have a doable time frame. Uh, original time frame, quite frankly, respectfully, I didn't think I could hit, could do. And th and that is that is true. And that's one of the things I really like about uh, our, our dealings with this firm thus far. They are they are very straightforward, and and y'all know I'm straightforward too. And so we we are getting. Very good advice in that regard, and I and I will say, Luke and all the committee members, I know it feels like I am I am pushing everyone, but I am because um, you know we we are working under very tight directives to make a very important decision uh, for our state, and I appreciate uh, uh, Parker pushing back and telling us that you know where we needed to to adjust, and I think we have a good plan. Totally agree, Mr. Williams. One of the things you'll learn very quickly is we're going to just tell you, we don't, you don't always have to like our answers, but we're going to tell you the truth of, of the dynamic. And um, what I want you to do is be in a position when this search is over, that people feel comfortable with the search process. Um, they feel comfortable with the outcome. They're not all going to agree with the outcome. Uh, you, I've never seen a search where every constituency group and every person liked the, the final selection, but we want to make sure that it was done in a way that the new leader comes in, not behind the eight ball of somebody saying the process wasn't right, or you tried to do this too quickly, or these types of things, because that just sets up a new leader for failure. And 
you know, people talk about the tenure of leaders and it's a little less than five years now. It was, and that just keeps going down, down, down. The reality of it is what we find is it's a crash and burn very quickly, or you can stay for a long time, right? And so that's where the number is coming down is because very quickly some people are going in and some of that is process. Some of that is the wrong fit, those types of things. But we want to do everything we can do to ensure that at the end, you may not like the outcome, you may not like the selected candidate, but you feel as if you were listened to and heard and the process was legit and real. Uh, and that's kind of what we stand by as a search firm as well. Lori, uh, Clarence Casalot, again, if I could maybe put you on the spot a bit, to what extent are you going to be personally involved in this search, hands on? I am going to make every phone call you can think of. I'm going to be on every one of these calls. That's one of the things that the committee asked us um, very early on. So we are a firm where we strongly believe that the person who sells the search um, should actually be involved in the search. And so that's a that's a nuance from that. So Portia Williams is vice president of higher education. She has been in um, with our firm for about 14 years. So we've worked together. She and I lead all presidential searches because quite frankly, they are so complex um, and they are so tough from that. So the two of us will be calling candidates. Uh, we'll be executing that. We're talking to thought leaders. We're recruiting. Um, and so that engagement is so important. This is not a search where you can just throw this big open, send an email to everybody and hope for the best. You've got to be very, very strategic about who you're targeting, how you're targeting. Portia has some, are, uh, some relationships that are better than mine with great people. I have some that are better than hers with great people. So we'll tag team this, but the two of us will be on every phone call. We'll be highly engaged in this. And, and that's, that's a commitment from the top of the house in our firm. That's great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other kind of questions about process, about kind of where we are? Just know we're going to overly communicate with you. Um, the only thing we'd ask you to do and we will never do is talk about candidates in, in any form of correspondence. Um, if we need to discuss something or you want to call us on the phone, be more than happy to do that. We believe in the spirit and the letter of the law. And we want to make sure that everyone knows that that's what we do. That's what we're about. Um, and so we want to be as, as, as transparent as we possibly can, while also talking to candidates and maintaining those conversations. And so just know that you're going to have access to us at any given time. We will go through your chair when we need to communicate with you, because I just that helps with a one stop shop there. But if you need something from us as we go forward, um, you know, I'll, we'll make sure you have all of our contact information as we kind of move forward. But just be on the lookout within the next week or so for correspondence about listening sessions, uh, job descriptions, timeline, those types of things, because we need to start getting that. The timeline is important to have an end game and to have every step along the way. It's important for you because you're all busy, but in our mind, it's more important for candidates because they need to know exactly what's this going to look like. How long am I going to be publicly exposed as a candidate? When are they going to make a decision? When are the interviews going to take place? And so um, we do everything to try to help you as a committee but it's all in the back of our mind is how do we get good candidates? So we try to build that into our process as well. So just be on the lookout for some of that. Um, one of the things we told Mr. Williams we wanted to talk about today, and we don't have a lot of time, but I'm gonna give you some opportunities to do it in a, another format as well, is kind of what you're looking for. I know the subcommittee group has been working on the position description and job descriptions are great, uh, but I like to kind of hear from people. What do you really see as the important characteristics necessary today, right, for this next leader uh, in this time? And then what do you see as the opportunities and the challenges going forward, not only for the leader, but for the organization as a whole, from the campuses, from you know all the different constituency groups. And so if we could just take this last 15 minutes to kind of talk about those things, and then we're gonna follow up, Portia, we can follow up with another survey um, that allows you as a committee to kind of give us the same thing we're gonna ask the other constituencies to give us as well. And if we had you to have another conversation, we'll do that as well. But just initially, what are you looking for? What would you really like to see? Not, you know, boilerplate job description stuff, but like in reality, what's important for this next leader to bring to the table? Luke? All right. So I'm going to take a stab at this. Uh, in my personal situation, 
I'm really looking for a candidate that can be a leader for the, the system that will address academics, research, extension, and help build a uh, help build a strategic vision that will move the university system forward, certainly including the Baton Rouge campus, but much broader than the Baton Rouge campus. Uh, and that means we're going to have to spend an awful lot of time working on strategy, but then bringing in the different stakeholders, many that we've talked about, but reaching out to state and federal agencies, to our legislative and executive branches, to our donors, to our students and faculty, and pulling them together in a way that we really move forward to truly create a great university. Do you think they're pulled together today? The, I, I think there's much room for improvement for where we stand today. Okay. That we've, uh, we're, not in a, we're not in a bad position. That's not what I'm saying, but, but I see so many opportunities where we can do and be more. Thank you, sir. Hey, Laurie, uh, Clarence Caslot again. I, I just want to add to what Luke said. I think uh, in my mind, uh, probably the, the critical aspect is being able to set that compelling vision for the future and doing so in a collaborative way, bringing everybody's interest to the table. But I think uh, a, a, a new leader is going to have to be able to deal with ambiguity. I think the same kind of disruption and new business models that we've seen in uh, business in corporate America is coming to higher education. So to a certain extent, we need people who aren't disturbed by change, who aren't disturbed by uncertainty. Uh, again, who can plan that future for the university such that LSU doesn't just survive, but we prosper and we thrive. And so I think strategic thinking skills are absolutely critical. And to a certain extent, people who have been successful in the past, that may actually be a liability because they sort of think they have all the answers. No one has all the answers. Uh, it, it comes down to that leader who can bring everyone together and define what the new uh, reality in the new future is going to be. So that, that's my view. Well, this is Les Johnson. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Uh, I have a question going back to your uh, prompting on, on process itself. I understand that, uh, well, we understand that, of course, the candidates themselves would like as much privacy as possible. That's totally understandable uh, for any number of reasons. However, this is an opportunity for us uh, I believe, and I think we believe, uh, to make absolutely sure where it's possible for you to help us with, to make sure of the, of the disparate group of folks that we want to apply for this job. We want males, females, we want a wide diversity of races, creeds, you name it. It's imperative for us to find great candidates from all these groups. I'm not necessarily interested in the best three candidates in the United States of America, which you may determine are all old white men. In other words, that's a disaster in, in this day and age. So it's where, with the understanding of the privacy needs of the candidates, we need to make sure that every, we need to educate the citizenry of the United States with your, excuse me, of the state of Louisiana, uh, with your help, that we are serious about a fair, wide ranging group of folks here that fit this job description. And I believe that's the philosophy of this group and, and the uh, administration of the state of Louisiana at this point. We've had problems in the Southern United States in the past, we want to put that in the past. We want to take this as an example for everyone to make sure that this is a fair, open process and show that to everyone so that it can be used in other searches throughout this state. So can you help us with that? 
Mr. Johnson well said. Um, and, and I will tell you that when Portia and I met with your subcommittee search firm, I don't know what they exactly called them, the search firm subcommittee, um, we spent a great deal of time talking about diversity, equity, and inclusion, and how do you ensure a process that sees candidates that represent the broader world. And, and we were impressed. I'll tell you, we don't take every search. We turn down probably more searches than, than most. Um, but Portia and I hung up with that group and said, you know what, I actually believed them. Um, and, and, you know, we're, we live in Georgia and we live in the South and we understand those dynamics. But, but we hung up and thought the sa- that we both kind of just said they asked the right questions. They implied to us and inferred to us a real strong belief in the importance of that. Uh, and that's what we believe, and that's what we try to do. And so one of the things that is going to be very important is for us all to go out and to do everything we can to recruit a diverse pool of candidates as it relates to gender and underrepresented groups. And then I challenge you all as search committee members is that once that pool is developed, you also have to review that pool and to to make decisions that allow for the continuation of a diverse pool of candidates. As a search firm, I want to remind you all that we don't have a vote in this process. We're going to aggressively recruit. We're going to facilitate. We're going to advise, but we don't have a vote. And so, Mr. Johnson, I think that that you're spot on from that perspective. I think there are some individuals that are outstanding. And what we've got to do, and it goes back to my original conversation as it relates to you as a committee, looking at the totality of the pool, looking at individuals that come from different parts of the world who come with different experiences bases. Um, you know, I don't think that diversity in a pool and, and excellence in the pool have to be mutually exclusive. I just don't believe that. Uh, I, I think that you can find that. So we're going to do that. You can challenge us on it. I'm going to tell you on update calls where we may be, you know, failing. Um, and we're going to work together to ensure that. And then you as a committee who have all the votes in this process uh, need to keep that in mind as well as you review the candidate pool of candidates. But thank you for that very much. Thank you. So what else are you looking for? I can tell you, uh, Roland Mitchell, uh, from the academic side of the house and particularly from the dean's perspective, I think that it's absolutely critically important that we have brilliant scholars, researchers, thinkers on campus, but it's not always the easiest thing to bring that that, uh, expertise to the broader community. So we need uh, a champion in that position that can speak our academic language to external partners to basically bring bring our expertise to bear. So uh, a good partner on the academic side of the house to to move us beyond the gates of the campus. Great point. And one of the ways that you can do that as well is look at individuals who, for instance, may be coming from vice president of research jobs, right? So they may be in those. Those jobs have changed dramatically in the last 10 years. They're much more external. And, you know, if you typically, when you talk to people and you talk to donors and you talk to boards, they want external, right? They want somebody that can build relationships across all the constituency groups, raise dollars, do those things. Um, But from an academic perspective, you want somebody who understands that as well, right? Who understands the challenges of research and how do you do those things? And so sometimes those VPs of research can bring that to the table as well because they get the respect of the faculty, but they also have an external side to them. So it's just one way to to try to diversify experience bases as you start to look at candidates. Hey, Lori, I'm Hannah. I'm the student member. Um, So from a student perspective, I think we want someone that's just truly an advocate for students. Um, We need someone that's responsive and open-minded. I think someone that is like willing to meet with us. So I serve in student government. So like we're constantly, you know, meeting with admin and working on things. So someone who's just really gonna be responsive and say like, hey, we need to talk about this and we need to make a change here. Or like, we need to be transparent about this and we need a president that's gonna be able to do that and be willing to work with students um, in that way. And then also just, we kind of spoke on it some, but our campus is becoming more and more diverse and making sure, and that's such a great thing. And we, we want that, we need that here. And making sure that with that diversity that we're being equitable on campus and making sure that we're not just saying we're diverse and looking like that, making sure that we're carrying that out through our inclusion and our equity and like just being intentional in that way. And a president that believes in that and wants to work towards that too. And Hannah, what campus are you on? I'm in Baton Rouge. Okay, great. Thank you, Hannah. Yeah. Hi, Lori. Um, I agree with everything that's been said thus far. I, I think one of the things, and Luke kind of alluded to this, but somebody that can 
can fully articulate and appreciate the totality of the land grant mission, inclusive of research, extension, and teaching, uh, and communicate that um, from a diversity inclusion equity perspective with the diversity of stakeholders and, and constituents that we have. Uh, almost visionary in, in, in some respects is, is what I would be looking for so that, so that we get out ahead and, 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 and not find ourselves trying to play catch up with some of these key issues that we've got to get on top of. Thank you, thank you very much. I think the land grant mission component is gonna be an exciting piece to candidates. Um, you know, the land grant institutions, there's some that are out there that are land grant in name only, uh, but I think what you do is you do differentiate yourself through extension and through some of those other pieces that, that land grant is really who you are. Um, and I think that will excite people as, as you move forward as well. So that's a piece that, that's so important as the, for the recruiting. It's a differentiation piece for some others. This is Lori Martin. I'm a professor uh, at the Baton Rouge campus, and I'm happy to hear all of uh, us on this call talk about diversity, uh, uh, equity, and inclusion. I think what would also be important for um, a successful candidate is that they recognize that while there's an interest in expanding um, diversity, equity, and inclusion on campus, there's also a great bit of resistance, both on the campuses and externally. And so we really need someone who's able to navigate um, that situation. Absolutely. And, and there will be, as we go out and recruit candidates, uh, you know, Portia and I talk about this often um, from that perspective, the South, and I think Mr. Johnson, you, you brought it up, the South does have a, you know, a concept of what, what it is, and, and some people will just say no, right? They'll just say no from that perspective. And so we've got to be able to do that. But, you know, that's why we always ask, uh, Lori, the, the challenges as well. So what are those challenges? Because I don't think that great candidates are scared of challenges. I think they just want to know what they are and they want to know the reality of them and do, does their skill sets match those issues, right? Both opportunities and challenges. So um, I think we'll hear some of that in the marketplace. Sure, and I, and I look, and I will say um, that certainly there are challenges out there. Um, what I want to say in terms of, of a candidate, and every I agree with everything that everyone has said, and certainly uh, uh, fit plays a part of that. And I would hope that LSU has positioned itself, particularly with the right uh, mouthpieces speaking on our behalf, Parker, that um, we can demonstrate to the outside world really what we have to offer. One of, one of the things that has really blown me away uh, since being on the board is how well we do so many things. I mean. Pennington Biomedical Research Center, it, it, it has groundbreaking research going on. LSU Health Sciences Center, Shreveport, LSU Health Sciences Center, New Orleans are, 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 have been on the literal front lines during the, the pandemic. Um, LSU Shreveport is pioneering online education. Um, I mean, we, we have the, the ag, I mean, the, the stuff we're doing with agriculture, I mean, Bill Richardson told me some of that stuff and it, it blows my mind. Um, and so we need a leader, I think, I mean, we, we've, you know, Professor Gonzalez knows what a fan I am of her. I have to stop myself from calling her professor. You know, I'm, 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 I've got a selfie with her and all this stuff and we got a Nobel prize, you know, at the university. I mean, it, it's just, and, and we need a leader who can sort of, who, who can sort of take us to that rock star status. I mean, performing arts, you go in our performing arts building and I mean, your head would pop off uh, on the main campus in Baton Rouge. And so we need a leader. We're doing things that the that the that the UT Austins and the Chapel Hills and and though we're doing things that they are doing, and and we just need a leader who can tie it all together and and you know put us um, on a, on a path and on a place that showcases some of the great things where we have going. And that's one of the things that we want to do over the next week or so is to try to learn as much as we possibly can, because those are the things that excite people right now. And especially during the pandemic, the greatest candidates, the best professionals, they're not looking to go somewhere to keep the trains running on time, right? They're not looking for a maintenance gig. 
Um, if they're going to uproot their families and they're going to uproot their careers to go somewhere, they want to go somewhere where the sky's the limit, where there's an opportunity to move the needle, an opportunity for not only little pieces of wins, but things that, again, as you said, Mr. Williams, strategically tie things together to, to really have glacial wins. And I think that is one of the things that that's how you differentiate yourself in the market. There's some institutions out there that really it is, let's just keep it going, right? Let's just keep it going. Then there's others where you can make, and I'm not saying a, a name for yourself, but a name for the university to get it the broader constituency groups out. So that's what we have to sell. We have to sell all those little pieces that are going to create an opportunity for a great person to say, I'm willing to risk it because there will be risk. There's going to be risk associated with being part of this search because of your open records and the rules there. And so there's got to be a win on the other side for someone to risk it, especially during a global pandemic with so much uncertainty about what's going to happen in the future. So those are awesome points. And we're going to, we've asked for some information and we're going to get even more about some of those little pieces because sometimes it's pockets of excellence that will excite someone, right? One one pocket of excellence. You talk about ag. Um, we have found that some of your greatest presidents and leaders come from ag. They came from that walk of life. They have a trajectory which allows them to gain respect from academics and their portfolio, but they also understand that one day you have on boots and the next day you have on a tuxedo. And how do you do that in a community with all these different constituency groups? And they've got that. They understand that dynamic. They know they have to do it. So, you know, those are the kind of people that we're looking for in this type of search. And, and that's what's going to excite them. And I want to be cognizant of, of time, Mr. Williams, because I know we're at, we're at time here and I, I don't I know it's your meeting, so I just want to be cognizant of that. And we can continue to have these dialogues, and uh, we're going to again, we're going to ask for some of this in in writing and feedback as well. But I just, I don't want to keep I, going on your time. No, I I appreciate that. the The committee knows I I like to keep time, but at the same, but this is, I consider this to be our kickoff with you, and so this is the opportunity. And I, I will apologize to everyone. We'll, we'll go a little long, not much. We'll go a little long today, because. Again, we'll talk to you whenever you want, but I don't want to hold things up because we have to have another one of these. So I, I'd rather let us all get it out on the table now. And uh, and so let, let's, let's take a little extra time if that's what we need. Gabby? Yes, I was going to say that I, I think that LSU has plenty of opportunities <laughs> and not as, uh, not as recognized as they should be, uh, like other people said. Uh, but there are also challenges that are not unique to LSU, but uh, I think that there has been progress, but there's still, a, there's still a distance between administration and faculty, between administration and, uh, and students, between the flagship campus and the other campuses. I think until, until being part of this meeting, I knew very, very few people in, in, other, in other campuses. So uh, those are challenges that I think uh, have been in, uh, have been improving in the last in the last several years, but it is something that I'm particularly looking for in a in 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 a new administration. And I know that's difficult because I know it's common in many other universities, but I would like ours to be different in that respect. And that starts with all constituencies respecting the person, <laughs> respecting the administration to be part of the team. And I don't really think that's the case just yet. Why do you think that is, Gabby? Why do you think there's a disconnect? Specifically, let's talk about faculty and, and Dr. Clark, you might be able to talk to us about the, the different campuses as well. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not really sure. And again, I can talk about <laughs> my personal experience within my uh, physics department in the, in the LSU campus. But I think many people, um, not so much myself because for different reasons I have been in different in different committees and in, uh, interacting with administration and seeing them and respecting them but I think many people just don't have the opportunity to interact enough and then don't don't have the opportunity to learn about people in administration and uh, and, res and and learn to respect them uh, and the other way around too. <laughs> So I think it's mostly a communication problem. 
Uh, but I do realize that, if, especially for this position, since we are looking for a president and a chancellor, the, the time is limited and the responsibilities are many. So that's why I'm saying that this is a very big challenge. And I think it's not just with only with faculty. I think this is also uh, from what I've learned and Hannah can, can say more, but I think it is, uh, it has been in the past at least felt by the students that they, they are not a team with administration, that they are parties confronting each other. Laurie, let me jump in since you've offered me the opportunity. Uh, Blake Chatling started the meeting with us with some recollections about the last search process. And at that time, that's really when there was the beginning of one LSU concept and having a single person being both over the system and the, the flagship. And uh, my perspective is that I came to LSU Shreveport in 1981 as a faculty member. I became the business school dean in 85 to 94, gone 20 years and came back in 2014 to LSUS. I was one of the first hires by King Alexander in the senior leadership position. Uh, <clears throat> I can tell you that uh, the one LSU is very real. It is uh, much, much more of a one LSU than it was ever before when I was involved. And there wasn't the connectivity uh, between the LSUS or LSU Alexandria or the med schools or whatever entity you want to talk about to the main campus as to which there is today. Right. And I think the, the level of interactivity between uh, the people on the flagship in the administrative leadership positions and us is uh, really uh, I, I think you could you could show that to any any system around the country and be proud of it. Uh, there's still more to be done. Don't get me wrong. Uh, every chancellor would agree that there's still more that could be done to to improve that. And so I would agree with what Luke had mentioned earlier. But I will say this: uh, that works. One of the things that we haven't done quite so well on is what Gabby was talking about in terms of connecting the faculty. And but even there, there's. Uh, uh, more and more collaboration being done up in the north uh, with us, with the LSU Health Shreveport. We have a we have a good number of collaborations underway and a joint program there. Uh, we need to do more of that within LSU. Uh, distance creates a challenge, but we've seen since what has happened with the pandemic that uh, we will need to do things differently. And I think that's an opportunity for how we do it differently and how technology will work. So I would hope that the person that comes in as a new president will be a firm believer in technology and how that can help provide connectivity. But unfortunately, over time, miles apart have separated us. Today, technology should join us. And so I would hope that that's one of the things that happened. We can have more of what Gabby spoke about. Thank you so much. Hi, Laurie. I'm Jessica Jones. I represent the LSU Eunice campus. Um, LSU Eunice is the system's only two-year campus, so that is definitely um, a very unique aspect that we possess. Um, I do like to chime in on what my colleagues have mentioned. Um, in the past, I started at LSU Eunice in 2018, but in the past, it seems like the reverberations where there were some disconnects, um, issues with lack of visibility, of the leader and the campus very recently uh, feels like there has been a rejoining with the one LSU, but seeing that really come to fruition, not just theoretically, but in practice. Uh, in October, we went through a horrendous cyber attack very quickly. All of our campuses responded. And I was told that in the past, there may have been lag because of the disconnect that was felt. So we are moving in the right direction. And so we definitely need a leader who can bring all of the campuses together and help us realize one LSU, um, you know, more uh, prominently than what it is now. Thank you. I'd like to add again from the perspective of faculty, um, just to take a, a deeper uh, dive, that at least on the uh, LSU uh, Baton Rouge campus, that there are concerns among uh, those in the humanities and social sciences that they're not given the same kind of consideration as the uh, so-called hard sciences. So um, a leader who would take that into consideration and would uh, recognize the value of humanities and social sciences and investments into uh, those areas as well as into um, other sciences.
Dr. Martin, we hear that a lot. Um, and I think that's a national trend from that perspective. So I think it's very important to say. Well, um, we'll, 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 we'll go about six minutes before we conclude the meeting. So I just want to let everybody know that we would be approaching the wrap up to see if, um, if there was anything else you wanted to, to raise with Parker. Laurie, this is Luke Laborde. You referenced earlier a rubric for evaluation. Could you, per, uh, I don't want to go into that now, but if you could circulate some samples of what others have done in that area, that would be really helpful. We absolutely will do that. We'll do it, Luke, once the position description is finalized. Your rubric, so there's like three pieces of this to ensure, to Mr. Johnson's point, that we're actually judging people based on the same types of things. So your job description will then go into kind of a rubric to determine, are we, are we judging people based on what we wanted, right? And then we'll do the same kind of concept with the interview questions. Are we asking questions based on what we said we wanted and what we evaluated them on? So as we go forward in the process, we're gonna provide that. We're gonna give you some templates. They're your documents. So to your point, we're gonna give templates then we're gonna kind of work through a process to agree to kind of what you want to do from that perspective but we'll get that to you. It may just be a little bit down the line once we get the rest of it done. I can be patient. <laughs> Great. One of the things I just wanna say, cause I know we just got a couple minutes here is the importance of you engaging in this process with the constituency groups that you're representing. There will be a time where there's a, a lull of information that will be going out to the broader campus as well, because we'll be in the recruiting mode, right? So we'll just kind of be hunkered down doing that. But you all are representing constituency groups on this committee. And so we'd like you, number one, to talk to them. Once this position description is finalized, send it to them. Is there anyone that you think we should suggest in this? I will tell you in presidential searches over the last 22 years, I have seen a candidate be nominated by a student that ultimately got the job because they had a student at another campus that said, we have the greatest person in the world on our campus. You should give them to be your president. Um, I've seen it obviously faculty highly engage in the recruitment and the nomination process. Um, community members have done it, staff have done it. So it is such an important aspect the nomination process we'll talk a little bit about and we'll send it out in the correspondence that, that goes out about the listening sessions is that we want that. We want the engagement of, if you think of somebody that this might be the right opportunity for, send us the name. All you have to do is send us the name. Anyone that is nominated or recommended will be contacted. We will manage that process. We'll call them two, three, four times to get a yes or a no. If they become a no, we instantly turn them into a source. Okay, give me three more names of people. We don't sit here today to tell you we know everybody because if anybody firm ever tells you that, just run away because we don't know everyone, but we want you to work in that process with us. So talk to the constituency groups that you're representing. Say, hey, feel free to send you know Parker a name and they'll reach out to them. And then we'll work through Mr. Williams to how do we communicate that to the LSU, the whole LSU community so they'll know how to nominate candidates as well. So be thinking of that as we kind of go forward through some of this pieces that you know we've got to do some of this logistics type stuff, but it's never too early to say, hey, I heard somebody great at a conference, or I have a friend who says they've got a great dean of business or something to that effect. So please engage in that part as well. So next steps for us is that, we'll, Gabby, we're going to work with you and your group to make sure that we get this position description, we get the announcements out about listening sessions. Again, if we have to do more than less, let's do more than less, right? Because I don't want people to feel as if they were, um, they were not included. I, I told Verge, Verge had a list, and I said, Verge, if I had to talk to every one of those people, um, I might be talking for six weeks before I even get started. So Verge has got an amazing list of of potential groups. And so we'll work through all of that to, to make sure that we're talking to the right people and engaging the right people so that they feel a part of this process as well. And then we'll work on the timeline and to get that agreed to, and we'll send it to you and we'll do some doodle polls and things to make sure your availability is good. Um, and then we'll be off to the races. Advertising, we're gonna advertise this position. We'll communicate with you where we suggest you do it. 
Um, we suggest you do it wherever HR says you should do it. And then you don't necessarily need to do much more because it's all going to be about proactive recruitment versus reactive recruitment. Um, but we will. We'll place it if there's a place you think it's important to go. We'll do that as well. So we'll follow up with some of the nuts and bolts as we go forward. And then I would just say be on the lookout for a call from us every now and then if we have a question or we think you can add some value in the recruitment process as well. Won't take too much of your time, but we need you. Perfect. Well, thank you very much. This was, uh, I think, exactly what everyone needed and wanted to hear. And I am convinced that we have the right folks for the job. So we appreciate your time and everyone else's time. Uh, before we adjourn the meeting, I'll let everyone know that until uh, uh, public health heads in a different direction, we will continue to meet by Zoom. So uh, until further notices, all of our meeting will be in Zoom and not uh, in person. And I will stay in communication with the general counsel about the legality of continuing to do so. Uh, given the hour, we will uh, uh, forego the, the working group reports that are on the agenda and we can roll those to our next meeting. And with that, I will entertain a motion to adjourn from someone. Move. Seconded. It's been moved by Mr. Kazalot, seconded by Mr. Laborde. I don't hear any objection. Meetings adjourned. Thank you, folks. For <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Thank you. <laughs> Happy Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving. 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 Thanksgiving.